Hey everybody. Today we're going to go over chapter 5, which is nuclear chemistry. So in general, if you know someone who has received cancer treatments, um, then you may know someone who has received nuclear medicine. So there are lots of different ways that nuclear chemistry is used in medicine to diagnose and treat diseases. Before we get to talking about more of the medical applications, we need to give you some more background. So first we're going to talk about some of the different types of radiation and, you know, protective clothing and things of that nature. So radiation is, it's natural, okay? So it's not something that's just created in a lab. There's radioactivity just in nature. And radioactivity comes from unstable nuclei. So anything that is has an atomic number that's 20 or higher can have an unstable nucleus. You can also find radioactive isotopes of carbon and hydrogen. An unstable nucleus is one where the nuclear forces, forces that are keeping the nucleus together, because remember, the nucleus has all those protons and neutrons, the protons are all positively charged. And typically, things that are all the same charge don't want to be bunched together. But there are forces that keep the nucleus together. When those forces cannot offset the repulsions between the protons, then you get an unstable nucleus. And they're radioactive, which means that they're going to emit small particles of energy that we call radiation to stabilize itself. And that radiation can take the form of alpha or beta particles, positrons, or pure energy like gamma rays. A radioisotope is an isotope of an element that emits radiation. And you can have more than one radioisotope of a single element. When you're describing the radioisotope, you're going to want to include the mass number in its name. It's just like the atomic symbols that we were doing in Chapter 4. So one example of a radioisotope is iodine-131. And it's used to diagnose and treat thyroid disorders. The way that you would write that using atomic symbols is you'd have the symbol for iodine, which is I. And then that 131 is the mass number. And then you'd put the atomic number. Here are some other examples of stable and radioactive isotopes of some elements. So we've got magnesium, which has a couple of radioactive isotopes, iodine, which also has some, and uranium, which doesn't have any stable isotopes, but it definitely has some radioactive isotopes. The types of radiation that we're going to talk about in this class are alpha particles, beta particles, positrons, and gamma rays. The alpha particles, that's just a helium nucleus. So if we were to write helium in atomic symbols, it would have a mass number of four, and there are two protons, so its atomic number is two. That is an alpha particle. Beta particles are just electrons with a lot of energy. Notice how the atomic number is negative one but there is no mass number. There's no protons, no neutrons. A positron is pretty much like if you took an electron, but instead of it being negative, it's positive. So we'll call it a positive electron because that's really all it is. And then there's pure energy like gamma rays where there's no particles or anything, it's just energy. This table is very helpful 
because you're going to need to know all the different types of radiation. In addition to the ones that I just outlined, you can also have um, protons released or neutrons released in terms of um, stabilizing a nucleus. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now let's focus on the biological effects of radiation. So different types of radiation will penetrate the skin and tissue and other substances at varying degrees. So alpha particles don't really penetrate very far. If you're just wearing clothing, then that is enough to stop an alpha particle. Beta particles will travel a little bit further and gamma particles further still. When you have ionizing radiation, it's going to do some damage to the body. And the reason why is because it forms unstable ions. You're knocking electrons all over the place and it causes undesirable chemical reactions. The cells in the body that are most sensitive to radiation are ones that are rapidly dividing. So bone marrow, skin, reproductive organs, all of those things, if they're introduced to ionizing radiation, that can cause cancer. So radiation is a big deal. You know, when you think about going outside and during the summer, you know, it's sunny and bright and happy, you really do need to use sunscreen because there's ionizing radiation from the sun that is penetrating your skin and it can cause skin cancer. Now you can protect against radiation for alpha particles, like I said, because they do not travel very far, paper, clothing, just being a regular old person will block alpha particles. If you're dealing with a beta emitter, something that's giving off beta particles, you definitely need to wear a heavy lab coat, some gloves, um, just to protect yourself. And with gamma rays, you need very dense shielding. So you need lead or concrete to block those rays. To stay safe when you have radioactive materials in your working environment, you definitely want to limit your exposure. And you can do that by simply limiting the amount of time that you spend near that radioactive source. And if possible, increase the distance you are from the source. So if you don't have to be right up on something, don't be. Give it some space to breathe. Social distancing. It's not new. We're doing it with radiation way before the pandemic. Again, you know me and my tables. So this table summarizes alpha and beta particles and gamma rays in terms of how far they can travel um, through air, through tissue, the type of protective gear you need. So that's the shielding. And then it gives an example of different uh, typical sources of these types of radiation. So you'll definitely need to know the information in this table, not necessarily the exact distances, but know relatively speaking, an alpha particle will penetrate, you know, the least and gamma rays will penetrate the most, that kind of thing and then what kind of shielding you need for each of the different types of radiation shown here. Now that we've covered the basics in terms of types of radiation, protection, and things like that, we can talk about nuclear reactions. When you have an unstable nucleus, it's gonna undergo what's called radioactive decay that nucleus breaks down, it emits some kind of radiation, and then you either make a new element and you give off a particle, maybe you just release some energy. So there's different forms of radioactive decay and that's what we're gonna talk about. So with a nuclear reaction, your mass number and atomic number may change, but the sum of the mass numbers and the sum of the atomic numbers are the same on either side of the reaction. 
So on the reactant side, and on the product side, the mass number, when you total everything up, should be equal, just like the atomic number. So here, we have a mass number of 251 and an atomic number of 98 on the reactant side. When we have radioactive decay, this is alpha decay, because this is an alpha particle. When you add together 247, which is the mass number of the new element that's made, plus the mass number of the alpha particle, you still get 251. And likewise, when you add together the atomic number for the new element plus the atomic number of the alpha particle, you get 98. So it should equal out on both sides. The first type of decay we're going to talk about is alpha decay. And that happens when a radioactive nucleus emits an alpha particle. You're going to need to know what an alpha particle looks like. So that chart in the previous section, you're going to definitely want to know what an alpha particle is. You're not going to get that information on the exam. When you have alpha decay, you're going to form a new nucleus. So it's going to be a new element that has a different mass number and a different atomic number. So let's just do an example. Let's complete the following nuclear equation for the decay of americium-241. On the product side, and I'm just going to use the pound sign to abbreviate number, our mass number is 241. And our atomic number is 95. We have to have the same thing on the product side. So our total has to be 241 for the mass number and 95 for the atomic number. But we've got a new element so we don't know what it is yet. So we know that we're going to have some new mass number plus the mass number of the alpha particle. For the atomic number, we know that we're going to have that new atomic number plus 2. The first thing you're going to want to solve is figuring out what your atomic number is because that's going to tell you what your new element is. So if you subtract 2 from 95, that will give you 93. Now, this number is going to tell us the identity of the new element. So always have your periodic table handy. You look up whatever element has the atomic number of 93. And what you'll find is Neptunium. Okay, that's NP. So you're definitely going to be looking at some of the bigger elements. We haven't been dealing with these when we were writing our um, electron configurations and things of that nature. But now that we're talking about radioactivity, we're talking about some of these bigger elements that have unstable nuclei. So we figured out the identity of our new element. Now we need to figure out the mass number. Just like we did with the atomic number, with the mass number, we're going to take 241 and subtract 4. And that gives us 237. So that is the new element that is created when we have alpha decay of americium-241.
Let's do an example for beta decay. So with beta decay, remember, this is like a high energy electron. So what happens with this is when you emit that high energy electron, your mass number stays the same, but your atomic number increases by one. So let's do an example with that. Write the balanced nuclear equation for the decay of potassium-42, a beta emitter, which yes, potassium has radioactive isotopes. So if you like bananas, there is definitely a fair amount of radioactive potassium in that banana. And that's totally okay. You're not going to die. You can still eat bananas and not worry about it. Notice how in the problem, we were not given the atomic number. It's not a big deal. The atomic number is always available because we can look it up on the periodic table. When you look at potassium, you'll find that the atomic number is 19. I'm going to abbreviate periodic table PT. At this point, we're still just writing out our reaction. So we have radioactive potassium and it is a beta emitter. Beta emitter means that it's going to release a beta particle. So we're going to form some element plus a beta particle. And that's why, again, you need to know your symbols for these different particles. We said that we've got a mass number of 42 on the reactant side. And on the product side, that mass number should stay the same. And we also know that that mass number is going to be the mass number for our new element, because when you undergo beta decay, your mass number stays the same. The atomic number on the product side is 19. We know that for our new element, and I'll just label it that, that the atomic number is going to increase by one. So we know that our new element has an atomic number of 20. That's enough for us to identify what our new element is. So you go to the periodic table, you find the element that has an atomic number of 20. That just happens to be calcium. We already know what the mass number is because it stays the same for beta decay. So you always want to remember your atomic number tells you the identity of the new element. That's the key here. Finally, we're going to talk about gamma radiation. With gamma radiation, you're just emitting energy from an unstable nucleus. And that's indicated by an M following the mass number. The mass number and atomic number of the new nucleus are the same. The only difference is this M. That is for the gamma radiation, that funky looking Y. That's gamma radiation. So that's it. 
You don't have to do any math or anything like that. You just write the element without that M next to it. And I like to think about it as like, so this reference may not be for everybody, but with all those like anime shows and stuff with like Dragon Ball Z and, you know, I used to watch all that stuff when I was like in high school. And if you are, you know, Super Saiyan or something like, ah, and it's like all that energy coming off, that's like gamma radiation, (laughs) you know? You release some of that energy, and then you're good to go. Again, may not be a catch-all analogy, but for those of you who do know what I'm talking about, you will not be able to picture anything else. You're welcome. So what we have here is a summary of the types of radiation. We've done sample problems for alpha emitters, beta emitters, and gamma emitters. We have not done one for a positron emitter, but it is pretty much the same thing as beta, only except for your atomic number increasing by one, it will decrease by one. So we'll be sure to do an example of that in class on Tuesday. So how do you make radioactive isotopes? Since we actually use these in medicine, you have to be able to make them. To make a radioactive isotope, you have to bombard it with particles. And that process is called transmutation. So you can take a stable nucleus and hit it with a particle like an alpha particle or something like that. And then you make a new radioactive nucleus that's like, oh, I have all this energy. What do I do? And then you can do some work with it. So we're going to go through a sample problem of producing a new isotope by bombardment. Again, you're going to need to know your different particles, including proton and neutron. You should know those already from chapter four. But if you don't, make sure you do, in addition to the alpha, beta, and gamma. So here we have to write a balanced nuclear equation for the bombardment of nickel-58 by a proton, which, re- excuse me, which produces a radioactive isotope and an alpha particle. The first thing you really want to do is write an equation. We've got nickel 58, and it's hit with a proton. We're going to write this in symbols in just a second, but I just want to boil down what the problem is saying. And we're making some kind of new isotope plus an alpha particle. So all of that information was in the problem. You're going to need to be able to read it and write it as an equation. So let's use some symbols. The atomic symbol for nickel is Ni. We were told what the atomic mass is because that's what that 58 is, the dash 58, that tells you the mass number. Remember that we can go to the periodic table, look up nickel, and find its atomic number. Again, PT's periodic table. So when you get just the isotope with its mass number, don't feel like, oh man, how am I going to figure this out? Always use your periodic table. You can always find the atomic number. So that does not have to be given to you. A proton is written like this. Just hydrogen. We're going to have some new element plus an alpha particle. And you need to remember that an alpha particle is helium. Just like before, we need to total up the mass number and the atomic number on both sides.
our mass number, we're going to take the 58 from nickel plus the 1 from hydrogen to give us 59. For the atomic number, you take 28 from the nickel, the 1 from the hydrogen, and that gives you 29. We know that the atomic number and the mass number have to equal the same thing, but it's just broken up a little differently. The mass number is going to be the new mass number of the element plus the four from the helium. And the atomic number is going to be the new element plus two. You always want to figure out your atomic number first so that you can identify what element you're making. You subtract 2 from 29, and that gives you 27. Then you run to your periodic table. Maybe you don't run to it, but you, you get out your periodic table if you don't already have it out. And you find the element with an atomic number of 27. That element is cobalt. Then you say, all right, I'm going to fill in that atomic number. Now I'm going to figure out the mass number. 59 minus 4 gives you 55. Cobalt 55 is your new element. We'll do practice of this in class. But once you get, do it a few times, you'll get the hang of it. So we've talked about different types of radioactive particles. We've covered types of radioactive decay. Now we're going to talk about how we measure radiation. So in 2011, Fukushima Daiichi was a nuclear power plant and it had an accident. Okay. Fortunately, these are not super common, so it's easy to remember when they happen. But it was a big deal. Um, so I don't know if you remember that, but it was a very big deal. It was all over the news. I was a, I was a first year graduate student when that happened. So it was pretty surreal, you know, being a real adult with big news happening like that. Um, so it was, it was pretty crazy. Let's talk about tools that you can use to detect radiation. A Geiger counter is something that every lab that does work with radiation has on hand. Also, nuclear power plants. Anywhere where there's radiation, you're gonna have to have a Geiger counter. There's different types, but they all work in a similar fashion. These instruments can detect alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. And the ions that are produced by radiation create an electrical current, which can then be read on the meter. There's different units for measuring radiation. There's the Curie, which is named after Marie Curie. And that, that looks at the number of disintegrations that occurs in one second for one gram of radium. Remember that she did work with radium, so that's why it's an homage to her. And that equals 3.7 times 10 to the 10th dis disintegrations per second. Then there's the Becquerel, which is also named after a person who did work with radiation. Um, and that is the SI unit for radiation activity. And don't worry, I have a chart coming up that's gonna summarize all this. Then we have the RAD, which is radiation absorbed dose. So that's talking about if you have something that is radioactive, it's giving off radiation, how much radiation is absorbed by a gram of a material that's near that source. So material like your body, okay? That's a very important one 
for biological reasons. And then there's the REM, the radiation equivalent in humans, and that measures the biological effects of different kinds of radiation. Also very important. The REM measures alpha particles, which while they don't penetrate the skin, if let's say you're having a treatment, like you're given an alpha emitter or something like that, a lot of damage can happen to your body. So alpha particles, if they can get inside your body, they do a lot of harm. So you do not want that. REM can measure high energy radiation. So high energy protons and neutrons and beta particles, things that can travel through tissue. And then gamma rays, which are damaging just because they can go straight through your body. And all that energy, they're going to wreak havoc all the way. They're going to knock electrons around and cause all kinds of unwanted chemical reactions. So the REM is very important when we're talking about, um, you know, if there is some kind of an accident with the nuclear plant or when we're taking t into account using a medicine or a tracer that is radioactive. So what you do is to determine the equivalent dose or the REM dose, which is what your body is going to absorb, right? You have to know the factor that adjusts for the biological damage. And those factors are listed here for the different types of radiation. And notice how the factor for alpha particles is really, really high. The way that you calculate REM is you take the absorbed dose. So remember, that's how much radiation your body will take up from one gram of that radioactive substance. And you multiply that by the factor. That tells you the biological damage that will occur. So you'll need to remember this. And we'll work a little bit with that in class on Tuesday. Do some sample problems. So we have different ways that we can measure the equivalent dose because we have so many different measurements for radiation. Oftentimes you're gonna see the equivalent dose measured in millirems. Remember, we can still use all those prefixes that we had with chapter two. So milli, deci, all of those things are still up for grabs. So you need to know those still. The unit, the SI unit for radiation measurement is the sievert. So we can define REMS in terms of sieverts. So there's an equality there. Again, chapter two, those equalities and conversion factors, they have not gone away. They just look a little different. In this table here, table 5.4, you're gonna get these relationships. Remember, these are also called equalities. You're gonna get those, but you need to know how to use them so that you can convert from one measurement to another. So why do we care about radiation damage? So lots of foodborne illnesses are actually prevented by the use of radiation. The FDA approved the use of radiation from cobalt or cesium to treat certain foods. So those foods, they're harvested or whatever else, and then they're passed through gamma rays to kill the bacteria. So tomatoes, blueberries, strawberries, mushrooms, all those things are allowed to be irradiated after they're harvested. And that extends their shelf life. Because have you ever gotten, okay, pet peeve. Go to the grocery store. Ooh, strawberries are on sale. And then you look at them 
and every single one of those containers is wet and sad because there's some strawberries in there that are like, I've lived a hard life, you guys. Just let me go. That is the worst. My family loves strawberries. My middle child, he will turn into a strawberry. I'm expecting that any day now. Whenever I get strawberries, he, he could, if I let him, he would just sit down and eat the whole daggone container. Okay. So irradiating these foods helps to extend their shelf life. They're not going moldy and nasty. And there's a little symbol that you'll see on the package if they have been exposed to radiation. So radiation is in more places than you think. It's not just a nuclear power plant or some, you know, mad scientist lab or in the movies, it's used in everyday life. So there are people who work in radiation labs. Um, if you work as an airline pilot or um, a stewardess, anything like that, because remember, radiation is real. So those cosmic rays and gamma rays coming from the sun, the closer you are, to, you know, the higher you are in the atmosphere, the more radiation you absorb. So you have to be, you either have to get tested or you have to wear something that indicates how much radiation you've been exposed to. So these dosimeters can detect X-rays, gamma rays, and beta particles. And there's a certain color associated with your um, exposure level because there are limits to how much you can be exposed to per day or per week, um, that sort of thing. So there are very, very strict guidelines for limiting exposure to radiation. This chart just has some of the um, things that we receive radiation from, and this is uh, based on a, a person in the U.S., so there's radiation coming from the ground, air, water, food, cosmic rays, the stuff that your house or apartment is built from. If you go to the doctor, um, go to the dentist, you know, all of those things. If you're getting an x-ray or a mammogram, all of those things are exposing you to radiation. If you live near a power plant, if you watch TV, if you go travel, which people aren't really traveling now because of the COVID, but all of those things expose you to radiation. So just an interesting little fact. The levels that we're exposed to are pretty low. But some of the sources include, like I said, potassium containing foods like bananas, cosmic radiation from the sun, so again, if you're outside and that sun is intense, even if the temperature is not hot, you still need sunscreen. If you're exposed to a high amount of radiation in a short period of time or just too much radiation, a large dose, then you can get very, very ill and you can actually die. Okay. So there's a table here that indicates the LD50, which is the lethal dose for half of a population. So if you have, let's say, 100 ants, if you expose them to 1,000 sieverts of radiation, half of those ants will die. For people, it's much smaller. If you had 100 people, and you expose them to five sieverts of radiation, half of them would die, okay? So that's what an LD50 is. It's the lethal dose for half of the population. Notice how much the LD50 varies. Insects and bacteria, they're okay. They're really okay. But people, and other bigger animals, we, mm -mm, we will not survive. So that whole thing about how if there's like nuclear warfare, then it's just going to be cockroaches. That's, there's an element of truth to that because they will survive 
much more so than we will. It's a little macabre, but the truth is the truth. Okay. So what have we covered so far? Types of radiation, nuclear reactions, and how to balance those equations. We've talked about proper protective measures and how we measure radiation. Now we're going to talk about the half-life of a radioisotope. Because remember, radioisotopes are unstable. So at some point, they're going to emit some kind of a particle or energy or some combination thereof. The half-life is going to describe how long it takes for half of that substance to decay to something else. So if we started with 20 milligrams of radioactive iodine and we waited eight days and then measured how much we had again, we would have about 10 milligrams. The half-life of radioactive iodine is eight days. So one half-life means that we're going to lose half of that iodine and it's going to turn into something else. It's going to decay. The new element that you form with iodine 31, 131 is xenon. So after eight days, half of that iodine will be xenon, and the other half will still be radioactive iodine. Wait another eight days for a total of 16 days, and that 10 becomes a five milligrams, and you've got 15 milligrams of xenon. Add another eight days to that, and you're gonna split that five milligrams in half again And then you're going to have even more xenon. And that keeps going, going, and going until you have pretty much nothing left. You can look at a decay curve that will show you the half-life of a sample. So if you're just doing an experiment where you have a radioactive isotope, and you know how much you started with, and you measure it every day, then you'll eventually have some kind of a curve that tells you what your half-life is. So you'll need to be able to read a curve like this and give information about the half-life. Here are some examples of half-lives of some radioisotopes. So you may have heard of carbon-14, so carbon-14 dating. The half-life for carbon-14 is almost 6,000 years, so it's a pretty long time. You may have heard about uranium. Um, it's a source for, of energy for nuclear power plants. It has a pretty long half-life as well. And then there's some medical isotopes. So we already covered iodine-131 with um, diagnosing and treating thyroid diseases. It has a half-life of eight days. But there are others that you can see here that are used um, medicinally. And notice that the half-lives for these are much, much smaller, much, much smaller than some of the other radioisotopes in this chart. So let's do some calculations. If we have strontium-90, which is a radioisotope, and it has a half-life of 38.1 years, if we start with a sample that has 36 milligrams of strontium-90, how much will we have after 152.4 years? We can write this half-life as an equality one half-life 
is equal to 38.1 years. And what we have to do is take our time, we'll call it time elapsed, and convert that to half-lives, which I'll abbreviate HL. And then we take that number of half-lives and figure out the number of milligrams that will be left. So for this first part, we're gonna use this equality here. If we have an equality, we can write a conversion factor. So one half life over 38.1 years. And then we can flip that over. 38.1 years over one half life. If we have 152.4 years and we're trying to get to half lives, that means that we're gonna want half lives in the top. So we're gonna use this conversion factor. So you take that 152.4 years and divide it by 38.1. That will give you four half lives. Now we just need to figure out what that means in terms of our strontium 90. If we're starting with 36 milligrams, the first half life, we're gonna go from 36 to 18. Notice how I'm preserving the number of sig figs here. For the second half-life, you're gonna divide by two again, and you're gonna have nine milligrams left. Again, still three sig figs here. After the third half-life, you're gonna have 4.50 milligrams and if you divide by two again for the fourth half-life, you'll have 2.25 milligrams of strontium-90. So again, to recap, we figured out how many half-lives 152.4 years equals. And we did that by using the half-life as an equality and writing conversion factors. We took the amount of time, which was 152.4 years, and divided it by the half-life. That told us that we need to go through four half-lives, so we need to divide by two four times. And that's what we did here. We started with 36 milligrams, we divided by two, and again, and again, and ended up with 2.25 milligrams. So we'll do another practice for this in class, but you'll definitely have to do this type of a calculation. Now we're gonna talk about some of the medical applications with radioactivity. So, there's all kinds of scanners and things to detect radiation and different reasons for why you would use one type over another. So radioisotopes with short half-lives are generally used in nuclear medicine. You don't want to have radioactive isotopes just wreaking havoc on your body for years and years and years. That would be very bad. Your cells do not differentiate between non-radioactive atoms and radioactive atoms. So they're going to incorporate those radioactive isotopes. And once they're incorporated, they're going to emit radiation. 
So while that gives you an image of the organ or whatever tissue it is that you want to look at, you can also do damage to your body. So they decay within a few months of use. Here's some more examples of radioisotopes and their medical applications. So if you have questions about this on your mastering chemistry homework, you're definitely one gonna ref going to want to refer to this slide because it tells you the isotopes, the half-life, the type of radiation it emits, and the medical application. So keep that in mind. So if you're gonna have some kind of a scan, you are prescribed a radioisotope that you have to ingest. And they'll give that to you, you know, a certain amount of time before your appointment. So you have to take it at this time. And sometimes there's specific directions about don't eat or don't do this, don't do that. And then you go for your appointment. And that scanner is going to move very slowly over that part of your body that the radioisotope has been absorbed in. And then they're going to see the level and location of the radioactivity that's emitted by that isotope. The gamma rays that are emitted from an isotope can be used to expose like a photographic plate and produce a scan of your organ. So you can see an image of your organ. So this is an example of a scan of a thyroid that has iodine-131 in it. It's a heat map. So the blue is cool and the red is hot. And the, uh, the colors in between indicate more and more of the radioisotope. Positron emitters with short half-lives can be used to study brain function, metabolism, and blood flow. So on that big chart that I showed you before, you're going to see carbon-11, oxygen-15, nitrogen-13, and fluorine-18. If you take one of these emitters, then you can image your organ, and you can get a 3D image, which is kind of cool. So a PET scan, that's the positron emission tomography, right? You've probably heard of a PET scan. If you watch any of those medical TV shows, Grey's Anatomy or anything like that, then you've probably heard of a lot of the things that we're going to go over. So PET scans, again, we just said that you can use them for looking at the brain. So you can actually look at the differences in a person with a normal brain and a brain that's affected by Alzheimer's disease. So the one on the right has been affected by Alzheimer's and you can see that there's definitely um, some differences in the structure. You can use a CT scan, which is computed tomography. And with this, you can look at organs like the brain, lungs, the heart, and you're using x-rays that are absorbed and you're looking at different layers of the tissue. So you can produce an image that has layer upon layer upon layer. And you can look at the, the different tissues and things inside of that organ and the differences in the densities of the tissue and the fluids can give you an image of the brain or the lung and you can see things like tumors. So there's differences in densities when you have certain illnesses in your tissue or in your fluid that will reveal themselves themselves with these types of scans. You can also use MRI, which is a magnetic resonance imaging. You don't actually use nuclear radiation with this, but what it does is when protons in hydrogen atoms are excited by a strong magnetic field, they will absorb energy. 
And since we have a lot of hydrogen atoms in our body, we're made up of a lot of water and things that have hydrogen. When you expose them to that strong magnetic field, then you can get an image. It's non-invasive, but if you're claustrophobic, it's going to be a struggle. So this is an example of an MRI scan looking at the heart and the lungs. So lungs. Heart. Let's talk about something more specific. So a direct link to health. Brachytherapy. You may have heard of this if you know someone with prostate cancer. So brachytherapy is an internal form of radiation therapy. And there's different types. So permanent brachytherapy can be used to treat prostate cancer in males. And it involves implanting these little titanium capsules, which are called seeds, in the affected area. And then within those seeds, you have a radioactive isotope like iodine or palladium or cesium. And they will decay over time. And that radiation that they emit will destroy the cancer that's surrounding those seeds. The, the upside to this is that you can have destruction of the cancer cells with minimal damage to the adjacent normal cells. There's also temporary brachytherapy. So the permanent one, you have these rods put in or these seeds, and that's it. If you have temporary brachytherapy, you're using long needles with much higher doses of radiation. So it's a much shorter time, and you repeat the treatment maybe every few days. So you put in the needle, and then after a few minutes, you remove it. With permanent brachytherapy, those boys are just in there, okay? So now we're moving on to nuclear fission and fusion. So we've talked about types of radiation, the protective clothing and things that you need, nuclear reactions and how to balance those equations. We've covered measuring radiation and the different instruments you can use, a Geiger counter. We've then covered um, medical uses, half-lives. So now we have to cover nuclear fission and fusion. So if you know anything about history, then you will know about the atomic bomb. That was based on our understanding of how large, unstable nuclei will split and release large amounts of energy. That process is called nuclear fission. So when you have a really large nucleus, like a uranium isotope, and you bombard it with a neutron, you make a really unstable isotope. And that isotope will split into two smaller nuclei and produce three more neutrons. So if you happen to have more uranium in the area, those neutrons can then spark another reaction, right? Another fission reaction. That splitting also releases a large amount of energy called atomic energy. Let's look at a visual of this. So we've got radioisotope U-235. You hit it with the neutron. Whack. It's like playing pool, okay? Billiards. Then you make this unstable uranium isotope that is like, I'm going to blow. And then you make two new elements 
you release neutrons and this thing here is energy lots and lots of it if you have a large source of u-235 let's say and you're producing neutrons after every fission event you can create what's called a chain reaction. And that chain reaction is what um, nuclear power plants are based on. So you have this source of uranium or some other isotope. And once you start that chain reaction, it's just going to go. So you have to have a way of controlling it um, and managing all of that energy and keeping things cool. So when you have a release of that much energy, things heat up quite quickly. So nuclear power plants are great. And just like any power generation, there are some risks involved. So not at all trying to down, you know, trash nuclear power or anything like that. Just saying that there are certain precautions that you have to take, just like with any, you know, coal powered plant or um, something that uses like steam turbines or anything like that. There's always cautions that you have to take. So that was nuclear fission, where you're taking something, you're bombarding it, and then it splits into some new elements, some energy, maybe you're making some new particles too. Nuclear fusion is the opposite. You're taking small nuclei and slamming them together to make a larger one. It happens at really, really high temperatures and it again releases a lot of energy. The sun and other stars are nuclear fusion reactors, okay? That is what they do. And they produce a large amount of energy, which we benefit from. So that's all the light and energy that the earth receives from the sun is from the nuclear fusion that is occurring. So we're fusing together really small nuclei like hydrogen, you know, fusing that together, making some helium. Maybe you're fusing helium with hydrogen. So very, very small. You don't produce a lot of waste, um, relatively speaking, with a fusion reaction. Fission creates more waste. So this is a visualization of nuclear fusion. You're taking different isotopes of hydrogen, because remember, there are radioactive isotopes of hydrogen, and you're combining those to create helium, and then you're making, you're releasing neutrons and lots of energy. That's the end of chapter five. So we covered nuclear chemistry, kind of the bare basics. And as usual, there's a concept map that brings together some of the terminology that you've been introduced to, and it relates all of the topics that we covered to one another. So this is a helpful place to review. And if any of these terms look unfamiliar, then you may want to go back through and you know, refresh yourself and say, oh, okay, that's where that came from. Or if you don't understand how two things are linked, then you're gonna wanna review that information again. But as always, we're gonna do some practice in class. We're gonna talk about it in class and that should help clear up some things too. Here are your reminders for the week. So you have a chapter five check-in along with Mastering Chemistry chapter five homework and quiz. And all of those things are due on October 4th. The chapter check-in, as always, you're going to submit that on Blackboard. And that assignment is in the folder along with this lecture. Your Master in Chemistry, you have to click on the link and do your Chapter 5 homework and quiz. Just as a heads up, make plans to watch the Chapter 6 video in preparation for class on Tuesday, October 6th. So that video will be dropping very shortly. Well, I say very shortly, but I don't know when you're actually going to be watching this. Anyway, 
be ready to watch that video because we're going to talk about it and you're going to have an exam that same week, which includes chapter six. I don't like doing it this way, but because of the condensed schedule, this is kind of what it's got to be. So I apologize. But exam two will be available Wednesday, October 7th through Friday, October 9th. And it's going to cover chapters four, five, and six. So we're going to cover chapter six. We're going to do some problems for it and do some review like we've been doing. So we'll review chapters four and five. We'll do some problems for chapter six and talk about chapter six. So you really want to be ready for chapter six on Tuesday, October 6th, so that the exam isn't struggle bus. That's all that I have for you guys. Um, as always, the reminder for office hours, Wednesdays from 2 to 4 p.m. I send out the reminder uh, each Wednesday. If you need time outside of that, please send me a message through Blackboard course messages and we'll try to work something out. All right, you guys, until I see you in class, stay safe.